There's a new nutrition study that is making major headlines. In this particular analysis, scientists at Stanford University randomized twins to either eat a vegan diet or an omnivorous diet. And at the end of the eight-week study, they looked at the differences in LDL cholesterol, triglycerides, HDL cholesterol, insulin, and total body weight. And we're going to talk about the differences between the groups after being randomized. Again, these subjects were twin pairs, so that's pretty interesting to look at how twins would respond because they have very similar DNA to different dietary approaches. So there was a total of 44 subjects, 22 twin pairs in this study, this eight-week study. We'll talk about the differences between the groups and the different dietary regimes, the calorie differences, carbohydrate differences, protein differences. But essentially what you're hearing in the headlines is there are significant changes that is reductions in LDL cholesterol in the individuals who were randomized to the vegan diet over the course of the eight week compared to the individuals who were randomized to the omnivorous diet group. In fact, you can see this graphical abstract here from the study that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association is cardiometabolic effects of omnivorous versus vegan diets in identical twins, a randomized clinical trial. So again, this was an eight-week clinical trial. The lead investigator, Chris Gardner, was also the lead investigator of a study that we talked about before called the Diet Fit Study, which was randomizing people to look at the outcomes of a ketogenic diet versus a low-fat plant-based diet. It's also worth noting that Chris Gardner, the lead investigator of this clinical trial, has received funding from Beyond Meat, as you can see under the conflicts of interest section of this clinical trial, which in my opinion represents a significant conflict of interest that is worth considering as we continue to dive into why at the end of this eight-week study there were not waist circumference measurements between the different groups as we'll talk about shortly. Him and I actually had an email exchange back in 2018. I asked him why he didn't run DEXA scans during the mid part of the study and as a follow-up of the study to look at the body fat differences with people eating a low-fat diet versus a high-fat, low-carb diet. And what I think is interesting about this particular study, we'll talk about soon, is in the baseline characteristics of the the study participants that were randomized either to the vegan diet or omnivorous diet, we have actually waist circumference measurements, but those were not part of the outcome data. We don't we don't know this the between group differences in waist circumference or anthropometric changes like body mass or muscle mass changes, body fat percentage changes. We just have total body weight, which actually favored the vegan group. It was about one kilogram or 2.2 pound difference over the course of eight weeks. But interestingly, this study really focuses on the changes in LDL cholesterol, low-density lipoprotein cholesterol, and it favored the vegan dieters. As they say in this graphical abstract that I'll share with you on the screen right here, a healthy vegan diet led to significantly improved LDL cholesterol compared with a healthy omnivorous diet among identical twins. You can see that changes are 13.9 milligrams per deciliter. Okay, so let's look at the baseline characteristics. We'll look at the media coverage on this and talk about what I think is sensational reporting. We talked about this with the Harvard Meat Study analysis. That was the epidemiological study looking at the health professionals who stratified people into quintiles based upon their meat consumption. And what we saw in that study is the people who tended to eat more meat over the course of several years also smoked more. They had a stronger family history of cardiovascular disease and diabetes and so forth. And Harvard scientists said, well, see, it's the meat that's causing diabetes when in fact we saw that those people also exercised significantly less, smoked more, had a stronger, stronger family history. So some interesting aspects of the baseline characteristics of these study participants, a supermajority of the study subjects were females. And what's important about this is because the main outcomes or findings and clinical takeaways from the study focus on LDL cholesterol. It's important to acknowledge that LDL cholesterol has never been shown to be an independent risk factor when elevated in women of any age. LDL cholesterol has been relegated to be a risk factor for young middle-aged men. Men, I, I fall into that category being 41 years old. If I had an LDL cholesterol of 150, that might be an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. But we now know there's fibrinogen, there's apolipoprotein B, there's all these other biomarkers that are associated with atherosclerosis and the formation of cardiovascular disease beyond just LDL cholesterol. But it is important to acknowledge that majority of the study subjects were women, yet the investigators focus myopically, it seems, on LDL cholesterol changes between the groups. But 
What's curious about that is we know that LDL cholesterol is not a significant risk factor for cardiovascular disease. We know that changes in HDL cholesterol, that is reductions in HDL cholesterol, might indicate increased risk for cardiovascular disease, as well as increased triglycerides, which, needless to say, the triglyceride and HDL levels actually shifted in the wrong direction on the vegan diet, but that wasn't actually talked about in the study, which I, I find very curious. What I also find curious is the body mass index blood pressure inclusion here in the baseline characteristics, as you can see, again, you're looking at table one right now, and waist circumference. I, for some reason, and I looked at the supplementary materials from this drama article, I didn't see any of the eight week post intervention changes in waist circumference. So I'm actually, as soon as we get done filming, I'm going to email the principal investigator and ask him why we do not have waist circumference changes, even though they're part of the baseline characteristics of the study. This is a very simple measurement that any medical assistant or anyone can really do. Again, this was part of the baseline characteristics. Why aren't we looking at waist circumference changes? Wouldn't it be interesting to know, well, yeah, we see LDL cholesterol changes, but what about all these other biomarkers that are relevant to cardio metabolic health? If one were to increase their waist circumference, but change their LDL cholesterol, I would not be so interested in that, right? We, we want to know the whole picture and not just focus on LDL cholesterol, but it seems that that's where things are being focused on in this particular study. So we're going to really dive into this and I'm going to share with you an email exchange between the principal investigator here uh, back in 2018, asking him why he didn't run DEXA scans on the diet fit study. But first, I just want to thank you all for being here. It's Mike Mutzel. I hope you're enjoying this content. If you are, please hit that like button, leave a comment below and share this video with a friend who may benefit from this information. And because we're talking about waist circumference, the importance of exercise and whole foods, I just want to remind you of the novel creatine containing electrolyte sticks by Myoscience. This is one of the best ergogenic aids that is free of stimulants and caffeine that can help you get more mileage from your exercise sessions. What makes this product unique is you get high quality electrolytes, real salt paired with creatine. It's been shown that electrolytes enhance the absorption of creatine. We know that creatine is very important for improving exercise performance, exercise output, even endurance, even possibly aspects of cognition and mental clarity. So if you're not supplementing with creatine around exercise, you are missing out on an easy way to help increase your strength and exercise performance as well as stamina and possibly support hydration because creatine is, is involved in hydration. So you can save over at myoscience.com with the code podcast at checkout. That's M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E dot -E -E com. Okay, let's go to figure two. Figure two looks at the changes in various biomarkers related to cardiometabolic health between the two groups. Again, we have people who were randomized, these are twins, randomized to a vegan diet or an omnivorous diet over the course of eight weeks. Now, there are some aspects of the diet intervention that I think are worth mentioning here. The first four weeks of the study, the both participants, whether they were in the vegan arm or the omnivorous arm of the study, were actually sent prepared meals. Um, and so they didn't have to do any cooking because some of these people have never ate a vegan diet before or possibly were vegan and now are being instructed or randomized to an omnivorous diet. So the, the investigators wanted to make sure that during the first four weeks of the study, people were following the diet properly. And so they sent the prepared meals. There was a lot of education. And I want to applaud the investigators and the team here that conducted this study for um, trying to control as many variables as possible. After the four weeks of prepared meals and proper education, the uh, participants were then uh, instructed to continue eating that way after they had a month of sort of um, eating, you know, commercially prepared uh, meals that were either vegan or omnivorous. And then after the fact, they went back into the uh, back into the, the center, the single center here and ran some blood work and so forth. And that's what we're looking at here is the changes in LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, triglycerides, glucose, insulin, vitamin B12, total body weight, and trimethylamine oxide, which is TMAO. As some of you may know, TMAO is a gut bacterial derived uh, metabolite that may increase cardiovascular disease risk. And although in this change, it does appear that the omnivorous diet significantly increases TMAO, this was not statistically significant, meaning there were some outliers here that the investigators had to remove to, in order to make this significant so they didn't uh, say that there were significant changes in TMAO. But what they did really focus on here in this particular study in terms of the outcomes uh, was the LDL cholesterol changes. As I mentioned, there was a 13.8 some odd uh, milligram per deciliter change and LDL cholesterol. So essentially, if your LDL cholesterol was 100, it would go down to about 87, let's just say, for example. But 
What I think is actually quite curious is the HDL also decreased. Uh, and so generally what we would see, uh, for example, when people start exercising or intermittent fasting, we would see a reduction in LDL cholesterol and an increase in HDL cholesterol. There wasn't much of a mention of the fact that HDL cholesterol actually also decreased on the vegan diet. And I, I think that's noteworthy because what we see here is the increase in triglycerides on the vegan diet, but not on the omnivorous diet compared to baseline. And so generally we want to see triglycerides go down, HDL go up, and LDL either stay the same or go down. But we didn't see that here. And I'm a little disappointed, to be honest, that there was not so much discussion about that unfavorable change in the vegan dieters compared to the omnivorous dieters. And the conversation, at least in the uh, particular article here, really focused on just the changes in LDL cholesterol and changes in fasting insulin. Uh, although fasting insulin is really important to acknowledge, and there are uh, changes of course, that were favorable in the vegan dieters and fasting insulin. Uh, we also want to see changes favorably in triglycerides and HDL cholesterol because we know that that ratio is actually an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Now, there were changes in body weight over the course of eight weeks, but looking at overall body weight without understanding where that body weight loss is coming from, i.e. is it coming from fat or muscle and what percentage of that? How? What is the change in waist circumference? Why didn't we see that? Because we do have the baseline characteristics of that. Okay. Now here's an email exchange. I'm not trying to pick on Christopher Gardner. He's an investigator at Stanford. Uh, perhaps there wasn't funding to look at waist circumference measurements uh, after this eight-week study. I'm not really sure. But um, I am seeing a trend here where we're not looking at body fat percentage changes and body composition changes after uh, looking at different dietary approaches. And I think that's really important. So uh, back in the Diet Fit study, which was uh, published in the fall of 2018, again, the title of this particular paper, if you want to go into it, I'll link it in the show notes, is the effect of low fat versus low carbohydrate diet on 12 month weight loss in overweight adults and the association with genotype pattern or insulin secretion, a randomized clinical trial. And so again, this study was interesting because they randomized people either to a low fat or a low carb diet, and they just looked at body weight, but we didn't look at DEXA scans, although there was a DEXA scan in the beginning and after month three, but not at the end. And I just emailed him and said, hey, if we're spending all this money on this 12-month diet, why aren't we doing DEXAs at the end to look at and see how much visceral fat changes are coming from you know, the different interventions? And he said, the long answer to a short question is sorry. Anthropometrics were collected at baseline, month three, month six, and month 12, but we did not collect DEXA scan at three months. And so um, I'm not sure why. And again, in this particular study, we have the baseline characteristics, we have the waist circumference, but we have no... Uh, analysis after the fact. I mean, this is a very simple measurement that has, uh, I think, significant uh, improvements in terms, we want to know, right? Uh, okay, so if LDL goes down, but your waist circumference increases, well, you know, should we be recommending to large swaths of the population that you should eat a vegan diet? Okay, so I'll get off my uh, high horse there, but let's look at the macronutrient differentiation here between the different diet groups. So as you can see here, there's not much of a difference actually. And so Again, I want to applaud uh, the folks over at Stanford for the food delivery and then also doing the education here because if you look here, the carbohydrate, fat, and protein were pretty similar. If you look here at the vegan, and again, this is actually found in the supplementary materials. It was about 48% carbohydrates in the vegan arm of the study versus 41% carbs in the omnivorous arm, 20% protein in the omnivorous group, only 14% protein in the, the vegan group. Fat was roughly similar. But what was interesting in Lane Norton commented on this is there was a significant difference in the overall energy intake. And so if you look here, going into the study, the baseline average calories that, that the different study participants were eating was about 1900 calories per day. Now on the food delivery arm and also the self-provided uh, arm of the study, remember the first four weeks, the study subjects in both arms ate prepared meals that were delivered to them in the following four weeks, they were instructed to eat uh, either vegan meals or omnivorous meals at home. And there are significant reductions between groups in the calories. And so that might ex explain the 2.2 pounds of weight loss over the course of eight weeks. Again, we don't know where the weight is coming from though, so I'm not super excited about that. But uh, the vegans ate on average 1,600 calories per day in the food delivery arm, and again, about 1,600 calories on the self-provided arm, the remaining four weeks of the study, while the 
Omnivores ate about 1,800 calories. So it's 200 calories a day, not a big deal. But over the course of eight weeks, you might expect a little bit of shift in body uh, weight. And that's what we saw, about a pound difference here. Okay. But what I thought was interesting is the meat intake. The meat was pretty lean. As you can see here uh, from this figure, the most of the protein was actually coming from chicken. And so uh, it wasn't a lot of red meat or beef or uh, eggs. It was a lot of chicken, uh, some fish, cold cuts, uh, a little bit of pork, but mostly, and we know chicken's very lean. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of chicken uh, necessarily, by the way. I have chickens for eggs, but I don't eat a lot of chicken personally, nor do I recommend my clients uh, eat much chicken. But when the individuals were making their own meals at home, you actually saw in terms of total meat intake servings, it was actually lower compared to the prepared meals. And so I thought that was a little interesting. But when we look at the meat alternatives, I think this is actually quite interesting. We see a lot of meat alternatives in the vegan arm of the study, especially when the meals were delivered. So the Beyond Meat and the Impossible Burgers and things like that. Uh, not a huge fan of these because again, we have basically ultra processed foods. Most of the protein is coming from wheat and uh, soy and things like that. Not a huge fan of those because they're hybridized. They're genetically modified. Oftentimes they're sprayed with Roundup and glyphosate, all sorts of problems. So the protein is not coming from, you know, whole real foods. This is processed foods. And so that might be why we see changes in triglycerides. Oftentimes when people eat more processed foods, their triglycerides go up. And so, um, uh, not a huge fan uh, of that. Now, what's interesting here is after the study, the investigators wanted to ask people, well, hey, now that you've eaten this way for eight weeks, what are the chances you're going to continue to eat this way? And so one of the study questions was after the study, I plan to continue to closely follow all recommendations for my eating pattern. Only one study participant in the vegan arm of the study said yes to this, which was 4.8%. So one out of 21 is 4.8%. In contrast, six or 28.6% of the omnivorous dieters said, yes, I will continue to eat this way. Now, I think that is quite interesting because people generally recognize that eating fake meat, fake meat products and, and all these other meat alternatives that are ultra processed is not really that healthy. Most people don't like the taste. They don't like the, you know, the processing of these things. Uh, and so they want to go back and, and sort of eat more whole real foods. And so I think that is quite interesting. So what are my thoughts and takeaways from this? Well, I'm a little disappointed that investigators at Stanford did not look at body composition changes after the course of eight weeks and only focused on LDL cholesterol, but didn't really mention anything about the increases in triglycerides and changes or in a negative way uh, in HDL cholesterol. It seems that the medical community and the academia at large is so continues to focus myopically on LDL cholesterol. Uh, but we now know that LDL cholesterol is actually just estimated via the Friedwald equation. Why aren't we looking at ApoB to ApoA1 ratio? shows, as I recommend in the blood work cheat sheet that can be downloaded via the link below. So we should really be looking at cardiometabolic health through a holistic lens, looking at all the different biomarkers, LDL cholesterol, triglyceride changes, changes in waist circumference, uh, blood pressure, and which, by the way, all of these baseline characteristics were actually included, but were not part of the follow-up. So that's my disappointment here with this particular study. And we, we see this oftentimes in many of these viral uh, studies that get a lot of media attention. Uh, we don't see the nuances talked about, and that's something that we should be focusing on. And that's why you tune into videos like this. And I'm grateful that you watched all the way through. Hopefully you found this information helpful. If you did, please hit that like button. Be sure to share this video with a friend who may benefit. And I will put this study in the description description below so that you can access it should you want to. And please also, if you do download the paper, look at the supplementary materials because there's some interesting information in there that you might benefit from. So we'll catch you on a future video down the road.